Um, welcome uh, to the LSE and welcome to tonight's event. My name is uh, Eric Neumeyer. I'm uh, one of the pro-directors of the school. I'm pro-director for faculty development and I will be chairing um, tonight's event. Uh, the event is an LSE um, government public lecture entitled Palestinian Rights, the Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions Movement and Transnational Solidarity. Um, I think the purpose is to bring together leading BDS protagonists. BDS stands for Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Against Israel. Protagonists, rights activists and academics to discuss the movement and its prospects. Um, we have five speakers who will, I will introduce them very briefly. Um, they will speak for about 10 minutes each. There will be plenty of opportunity to ask questions after the speakers have um, spoken. And um, I would like that to be questions, not many lectures, uh, when we get to that. Um, I would like you I would just like to also say that, um, where do I have that bit? Sorry, here. Um, so sort of in, in terms of ground rules, it's a fundamental purpose uh, for the school that exists for the pursuit of learning. Its purpose, therefore, can only be achieved if all its members and visitors also to it can work and conduct their business peacefully and in conditions which permit freedom of thought and expression within a framework of respect for the rights of other persons. And I hope we can hold this event in the spirit of this. Um, so we have a, an, an order of speakers. Um, we will start with Omar Baguti, who is the co-founder of the BDS movement. Omar, over to you. Ten minutes. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'll speak about BDS and the struggle for Palestinian rights, negotiating the terrain between ethical consistency and strategic efficacy. Stephen Biko, the South African liberation leader who founded the Black Consciousness Movement, wrote, quote, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. From apartheid South Africa to the Jim Crow South in the US to Palestine to here in the UK, Biko's insight has proven to be spot on. 100 years after the Balfour Declaration, it has become more evident than ever that a key part of the Zionist settler colonial project in Palestine has been to colonize not just the land of the indigenous Palestinians, but our minds as well, by searing into our consciousness the imperative of submission to Israel's injustices as fate and the futility of hope. Consequently, the struggle for Palestinian justice has always been conditioned upon liberating our minds from the deeply seated despair and powerlessness that inhibit them and embarking on a radical process of instilling realistic hope. This is precisely why Israel is desperately trying to suppress or even criminalize the global Palestinian-led boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, a main source of hope a key part of our popular resistance, and the most effective form of international solidarity with the Palestinian struggle for rights. BDS is particularly effective because it is supported by near consensus among Palestinians at home and in exile. It is mainstreaming the UN stipulated rights of the entire Palestinian people, <coughs> excuse me, while simultaneously adopting context sensitive, winnable, gradual, and sustainable campaigns to advance on the ground the struggle for self-determination. BDS, in other words, has largely succeeded in reaching a golden balance between ethical consistency and strategic efficacy. Human rights defenders always face the dilemma of whether they should prioritize ethical principles over goal-oriented efficiency. While there's often a trade-off between the two, they're not mutually exclusive, and opting for one extreme or the other can be detrimental to any social movement. Persistently setting our objectives too high to meet our utmost ethical standards would condemn us 
to a fatal and fatalistic addiction to marginalization. On the other hand, if our objectives conveniently respond only to the requirements of current circumstances without much consideration for our principles, we run the risk of being co-opted by hegemonic forces. We then settle for the more comfortable chains, as Archbishop Desmond Tutu would say, while convincing ourselves that we're breaking the chains altogether. In the BDS movement, we transcend the ineffective rhetorical support and insist that we do not beg for charity, we appeal for solidarity. And at a minimum, this entails cutting all links of complicity to Israel's system of injustice that oppresses us in the academic, cultural, economic, military fields. This is a profound moral and often legal obligation, especially when your tax money and your elected officials are deeply implicated in maintaining Israel's system of oppression. Begun in 2005 by the largest coalition in Palestinian civil society, BDS calls for ending the 1967 occupation, ending the institutionalized and legalized system of racial discrimination, which meets the UN definition of apartheid, and upholding the UN stipulated right of return for Palestinian refugees who were uprooted and dispossessed since 1948. These three basic rights correspond to the three main constituencies among the Palestinian people. 38% are in the occupied West Bank and Gaza, including East Jerusalem. 12% are Palestinian citizens of Israel, and 50% are Palestinian refugees in exile. BDS draws a lot of inspiration from the growing bonds of mutual solidarity with movements defending the rights of refugees, immigrants, women, workers, blacks, Muslims, indigenous nations, and the LGBTQI communities. Anchored in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, BDS has consistently and categorically opposed all forms of racism and racial discrimination, including anti-Jewish racism, anti-black racism, and Islamophobia. One's identity, the movement upholds, should never diminish one's entitlement to rights. BDS, therefore, targets complicity, not identity. Since there's nothing Jewish about Israel's regime of occupation, siege, ethnic cleansing, and apartheid, there is nothing inherently anti-Jewish then about a nonviolent, morally consistent struggle to end the system of oppression. In fact, a 2014 poll by an Israel lobby group in the US shows that 46% of non-Orthodox Jewish American men under the age of 40 support a full boycott of Israel to end its occupation. But since hope based on illusions does not bring us any closer to justice, one must always check whether the hope that we're nourishing is based on not just morally consistent vision, but also effective strategies of resistance. The dramatic shift in international public opinion in the last few years, coupled with Israel's historical war, his hysterical, excuse me, war on the movement, indicates that BDS is succeeding in raising awareness about Palestinian rights and raising the material and psychological cost of Israel's regime of oppression. Earlier this year, a major Danish pension fund, for example, decided to divest from all Israeli banks involved in financing the occupation, uh, following the lead of a major Dutch pension fund in 2014 and the United Methodist Church in the US in 2016. The municipality of Barcelona announced months ago, measures to end complicity in Israel's military occupation, following dozens of local councils across the Spanish state that have recently declared themselves Israeli apartheid free zones. In the last two years, major multinational corporations like Veolia, Orange, CRH, and G4S have suffered major financial and or reputational losses due to effective BDS campaigning in the UK, Ireland, across Europe, Kuwait, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Latin America, or elsewhere, leading those companies to end all or most of their involvement in Israel's violations of international law. Since 2015, more than 1,200 cultural figures in the UK have signed a pledge in support of the cultural boycott of Israel, following similar initiatives in Montreal, Canada, Ireland, South Africa, and elsewhere. While many artists have refused to perform in Tel Aviv or canceled gigs there, of the 26 Oscar nominees in 2016, none has taken an all-paid propaganda trip offered by the Israeli government. 
Academic associations and tens of student governments across the world have also voted for BDS measures. But BDS cannot claim full responsibility for Israel's growing isolation in various fields. Israel itself deserves a share of the credit. <laughs> the 2015 election brought to power Israel's, quote, most racist government ever, dropping the thin mask of democracy and liberalism. Government ministers have adopted unabashed far-right racism, while the fundamentalist chief rabbi of the Sephardic community recently called for the ethnic cleansing of Gentiles, quote-unquote, from the land of Israel. Ehud Barak, a former Israeli prime minister, has warned that Israel is, quote, infected by the seeds of fascism. And the current deputy chief of staff, Major General Yair Golan, has compared, quote, revolting trends in Israeli society to Germany in the 1930s. Uh, a recent BBC poll shows that Israel has the fourth lowest popularity among the many countries surveyed. This is partially explained by the fact that Israel is more than ever associated with the rising far right around the world, including xenophobic and anti-Semitic groups, especially in the US and Europe. Israel's regime of racist oppression has become a model, in fact, for the Trump administration and for the alt-right xenophobic agenda. Richard Spencer, for instance, has defended his supremacist movement's notion of white nationalism as, quote, a sort of white Zionism. As a result, BDS has become one of the facets of the growing global resistance to the far right. Having lost many battles for the hearts and minds at the grassroots level, Israel adopted in 2014 a top-down strategy that employs legal warfare, espionage, and intensified propaganda to undermine or outlaw BDS advocacy altogether. One desperate Israeli government minister has publicly threatened BDS human rights defenders, including myself, with, quote, targeted civil assassination, while another established a tarnishing unit, that's the official name, against us. An Israeli anti-BDS law now denies entry to anyone associated with an organization endorsing the boycott of Israel or of its illegal settlements. Israel's anti-BDS Ministry of Strategic Affairs is working on a blacklist of Israelis who are active in any boycott activity. A city in Texas just recently implemented anti-BDS legislation by conditioning humanitarian hurricane relief on a promise not to boycott Israel or its illegal colonies. The American Civil Liberties Union condemned this as, quote, an egregious violation of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, reminiscent of McCarthy-era loyalty oaths, end of quote. Far from protecting its impunity, and I'm getting to the end, Israel's push for draconian anti-BDS legislation is alienating the liberal mainstream which may partially explain why almost half of all Americans in a 2016 poll support sanctions against Israel to end its occupation. The BDS movement is fighting back this repression and winning some remarkable battles. The European Union, the governments of Sweden, Ireland, and Netherlands, as well as the parliaments of Switzerland and Spain have all defended the right to boycott Israel as a matter of freedom of speech. We're waiting for, for the British government to do the right thing. I guess we'll be waiting some time. <laughs> to conclude, despite its relentless and well-funded efforts to crush the BDS movement, Israel's regime of oppression is failing. A human rights movement that is rooted in a long heritage of struggle for rights and that is winning the hearts and minds of people of conscience all over the world cannot be defeated by Israel's new McCarthyism, propaganda, or legal warfare. With our popular intersectional resistance, we're asserting our inalienable right to live in justice, in freedom, with equal rights and unbound dignity. Thank you. We will have a question and answer session at the end, so we're going to move straight to the second speaker, Samia. Al-Botme, if I got this right. Yes. She's an assistant professor at Beerside University. Uh, Samia, please, 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I've been asked to speak about what uh, BDS means to the Palestinians um, in Palestine, and I've chosen to focus on two particular issues. Um, particularly to the Palestinians in the uh, West Bank and uh, Gaza Strip. 
Uh, my two issues, uh, the first one is how BDS uh, challenges the PA's uh, forms of internalized colonialism uh, that Omar touched upon as, uh, uh, as a form of uh, colonizing the minds of uh, the people. Uh, my second point uh, that I chose to focus on comes from my uh, area of speciality in economics, which has to do with how Israel over the years actually created um, a very structured system of dependency, economic dependency, and, and that system actually translates into political and social dependency of the Palestinians on Israel. So I'll focus very quickly on, on these two uh, points. Um, I'm here quoting uh, Fanon, who also worked on the issue of um, internalized colonialism or colonization of the mind. And uh, his work in Algeria in the late 50s and 60s, um, basically in his, in his ideas, there is uh, <coughs> enormous, uh, he knows, there is enormous social, uh, psychological, and infrastructural work in producing uh, the colonized. The colonizer is always very busy. Uh, he, arg he argued, Fanon that is, that the sustained uh, uh, denigration and injustice that the colonized are subject to often lead to um, identity confusion and feelings of inferiority among the colonized. Uh, this can lead individuals to internalize uh, the messages of inferiority uh, and to uh, active self-fulfilling prophecies as uh, oppressed individuals and their political elite begin to cooperate with the oppressor's agenda. And here I'm talking about mainly the PA structure and not just the top tier of the PA structure because that's, on, that's a level that uh, the relationship to Israel is not just based on internalized colonialism or colonization of the mind, but also based on interests. Um, the uh, colonization uh, of the mind operates on individuals and groups to maintain power structures and benefit uh, the oppressors and lead to intra-group uh, fragmentation where the oppressor becomes the model of acceptable humanity. Uh, internalized colonialism also reinforces oppression because it generates mistrust and criticism of emerging leaders and result in burnout and abandonment of a vision of liberation. So this is the concept of internalized uh, colonialism. Now, how does that fit into the PA structures? Um, it fits on the level of how the PA actually redefined the Palestinian people as part of its relationship with Israel. The Palestinians are defined as the residents of the West Bank and Gaza Strip, who actually account for only 39% of the Palestinians. Um, its vision of liberation is a vision of uh, state building. Um, the PA very much has accepted and adopted Israel's definition of the Palestinian question uh, as a conflict-based uh, uh, question with symmetry of power and justifying this sort of reasoning based on uh, being strategically pragmatic. Um, uh, the PA has also enforced the Oslo Accords unilaterally uh, and has been adopting it as if it is its, its main purpose of existence. The PA has also engaged Israel on security cooperation and several times con condemned Palestinian attempts of resistance against Israel. Um, the PA has also welcomed the intervention of the international community, which defines the conflict along the lines of sort of natural disasters because we're always receiving aid and support, mostly humanitarian, and parties that receive humanitarian aid are mostly those hit by natural disasters. Mm -hmm. So the PA has very much accepted uh, uh, that logic. For the PA, BDS is uh, an issue that only applies to the settlements. It doesn't apply to uh, uh, the broader Israeli goods and services, uh, as well as um, anything that comes out of uh, Israel. Now, the, these are the notions that the PA, through which 
uh, internalized colonialism has manifested itself through the PA structures. Now, how BDS challenges that? Uh, BDS, in a way, challenges uh, all these practices, practiced forms of subjugation by allowing the indigenous Palestinian people to define who they are, rather than define them in cooperation with the colonized, sorry, with the colonizer. Uh, BDS refines the reality on the ground as a colonization process with no symmetry uh, of power. It requires also international community to interfere on the political level through solidarity, through pressuring Israel, rather than through mitigating the impact of colonialism on the po Palestinian population through humanitarian aid. Uh, it basically, BDS for the Palestinian, gives people hope for liberation rather than just surviving colonialism, and it actually strengthens uh, our self-agency to resist Israel's subjugation with a vision of decolonization and ending apartheid rather than establishing a Bantustan in the form of a Palestinian state. Hence, it is a hope for liberation, it is a mechanism for ending subjugation. This is how we see BDS on the ground in Palestine. In terms of my second point, which has to do with how Israel over the years actually mechanized uh, 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 our subjugation economically, which has translated into very uh, strong, powerful political and social domination, um, I mean, this is something that we think Israel has learned from other colonizers. The British were very masterful in this in, you know, around the world, the French. Uh, in South Africa, it was very much used against the indigenous population. And it had to do with basically undermining the capacity of the uh, indigenous population to, um, uh, to grow economically through the destruction of their productive capacity. This is very clear in very many political and economic documents uh, written by the Israeli government in 1967-68 uh, that one of the sort of, uh, sort of most strategic purposes is to destroy the Palestinians' capacity to produce. And over the years, Israel has undermined uh, Palestinians, uh, Palestinian agricultural and uh, manufacturing sectors. Now, this is not, production is not about uh, the economics. Production is about the political and social cohesion of a society. That's why Israel invested so much in undermining pa uh, Palestinian capacity to, produ to produce. Over the years, this has meant basically confiscation of land, confiscation of water. Uh, this has also meant that Palestinians weren't allowed to e export and import uh, freely. It also meant that uh, we couldn't set up uh, uh, an industry. Um, this basically translated itself into full dependency on Israel and uh, uh, this full dependency on Israel um, has been used by Israel over the years to uh, undermine our political capacity. At times, Israel used this structural, this economic uh, structure, which basically meant most of what we live on is actually imported from Israel. We currently uh, import nearly $5.5 billion. I mean, the figures are small, but uh, this tells you the reality that we live under. Um, nearly 3.5 of these come from Israel. Um, this means that our capacity to um, self-sufficiency is non-existent. Um, now, BDS really works at the root of uh, of this to enable the Palestinians to um, uh, build their productive capacity, hence be able to challenge uh, Israel. Uh, and it does that by 
uh, uh, through boycotting Israeli goods and commodities, Palestinians can build their local economy. Building their local economy has implications for our political uh, uh, struggle against Israel. In 2000, uh, when the Second Intifada started, uh, the Israel did not allow the Palestinians, did not transfer taxes to the Palestinians for over a year. This has actually made the Palestinians uh, 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 give a lot of political concessions to Israel in order, in order for these taxes to return to normal. We tell you why of what okay. we can tell us, tell us why those taxes won't transfer. Okay, we'll, we'll have okay, to we'll answer that in the question oh, and no, answer. No, 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 no. And we'll get to the question and answer session. Question registered, she will answer it at the question and answer session. So uh, you, you yes, I'll finish. No, I'll finish. Uh, basically, uh, basically, okay. BDS allows us to, uh, in a way, substitute. All, the, all this dependency on Israel through self-building uh, our economy, hence uh, having more of a capacity for uh, a political uh, agency and not being under uh, the mercy of Israel. Uh, it allows us to employ people, it allows us to survive colonialism, and at the same time challenge it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Charlecraft is going next. He is Professor of Middle East History and Politics in the Department of Government here at the LSE. John, please. Uh, and, and you have a presentation, is that right? Yes, I do. Go ahead. Uh, well, thank you all for coming. Can, uh, can you yeah. see the... Great oh. pleasure to be here. Uh, part of the purpose of this event is to put activists and academics and the academic community, you and the public, together. That's really exciting for me, especially on such an important instance of rights-based transnational solidarity. It's exciting partly because it drives academic research and innovation. It's also exciting because it means that as academics, we're not in the ivory tower. We're engaged with burning contemporary social and political problems. So really, I'm, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm very excited and I'm, I'm happy that we, we, you know, we're able to discuss this issue and, and learn from one another, and from you. I, I've just recently, in the last one or two years, started up research on transnational rights-based solidarity in relation to the Middle East and North Africa. And so I'm looking at a number of cases. I'm looking at cases around what's happening in Egypt. I'm looking at cases of workers' rights in the Persian Gulf. But I'm also looking at pan transnational uh, 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 movements around Palestinian uh, rights. So uh, I want to pick up here on the case of Veolia. So we know the BDS movement has been active transnationally around Palestinian rights since 2005. It's about after 2010 that the cause suddenly becomes very widely known. One target of this movement is private sector actors who are said to aid and abet settler colonization and occupation and all the attendant violations of law and rights that are at work. It's a very important, interesting uh, strategy. One of those targets was the French multinational environmental services company, Violia Environnement Société Anonyme. And it was targeted uh, after 2005 uh, over the operation. It had operating rights in the Jerusalem Light Rail. And the reason they targeted it is because the Jerusalem Light Rail connects pre-67 <coughs> Israel, Mount Herzl, West Jerusalem, and so on, with occupied and colonized East Jerusalem, <coughs> occupied after 67 over here, as you can sort of see on the map. So what's really interesting about this case is you have a major multinational environmental services company with tens of billions of paid up capital listed on several stock exchanges, which uh, by 2015 had divested completely from the Israeli market. Now, BD, Veolia itself explained this as a case of corporate restructuring. But there was a lot of commentary in the press at the time, financial and otherwise, that actually this was about BDS pressure. So the question, you know, is this about corporate restructuring or is it about BDS pressure? And so I have this whole set of methodologies and, and theoretical frameworks around something that I call dynamic interaction analysis, 
to try and understand the case. So to begin, you know, a definition of transnational activism is as yet uninstitutionalized collective action for or against change that substantially crosses national borders. So it has a lot to do with the dynamics of collective actors that are in becoming. But, you know, and of course it intersects with a somewhat more institutionalized field of transnational civil society and, act, and advocacy. But it's also distinct from, and this is uh, what I'm sort of interested in analyzing, it's distinct from but intersects with other entrenched fields, whether political and civil society, whether actual governments or interstate processes and institutions, or forms of economic power, or rights holders, you know, social groups uh, on the ground. So there are all these intersections and, and this kind of analysis tries to, <coughs> tries to figure them out uh, and how they operate, especially at the meso group level, over time. So this is my sort of foolhardy, rather crude diagram of how you have some of these fields where you have government fields, international processes, forms of economic power, political and civil society. And, and these are, are sort of fields. They have entrenched strategies, interests, positions, path dependencies. But within them, you have meso level groups that interact and engage in sort of strategic and, and, and also expressive kinds of action. Anyway, so my analysis to try and put all this uh, in, into uh, a way of trying to understand things over time. And if we simply transpose this onto the earlier, then we see, you know, the transnational activist actors over here, and they, of course, you know, it's quite simple. They try to change Veolia. They try to make it divest from Israel and the occupied territories, and that's supposed to have all sorts of other indirect effects on all the other actors uh, in this kind of dynamic set of interactions. So, just first point, if you put this all on a timeline, you can immediately see that the corporate restructuring explanation is completely bogus, insofar as Veolia start to try to withdraw from Israel before the corporate restructuring is, uh, is born. It's about the only thing we know in the social sciences to be true is that causes have to come before their effects. <laughs> and, and in this case, they start trying to divest in June 2009. And whereas the corporate restructuring doesn't begin till July 2011. And subsequent to that corporate restructuring, there are all these sort of public commitments to Israel. Here's Veolia's Denny Gasquet, senior executive, comes to Israel February 2010. He says, I want to affirm that we're going to still be in Israel for another 20 years. Here he is speaking to Uri Starkman, who's uh, the head of Veolia Israel. So, but by July 2015, in spite of the commitments and so on, Veolia has divested completely from the four things that it was doing in Israel. The bus is not just the Jerusalem Light Railway, but also bus lines, top land landfill, water treatment, and so on. But it, Veolia admits reputational damage in public from BDS, but it doesn't go as, yeah. But. Now, if we do a more interpretive analysis, what are these collective actors thinking and doing? Turns out that absent BDS, the reasons to leave the Israeli market are not compelling. And there are a whole lot of possible reasons, and I'm not going to go through them here, but it turns out they're not so compelling. And in fact, there's reasons why they might want to stay in Israel. According to Veolia's corporate strategy, which has a lot to do with R&D around the environment, and Israel is constantly being uh, praised by Veolia for having this R&D environment, so on and so forth. So, absent BDS, it's very difficult to find a compelling reason why a BD, why Veolia would actually want to live. So, my analysis is sort of here. Veolia is vulnerable, was partly vulnerable to BDS pressure because of its business structure. And the key is simply that Veolia sells an enormous amount of uh, services. It sells environmental services to municipalities uh, all over the place. Uh, in Europe, the US, and Australia, and so on. And the thing is, unlike its industrial clients, the only, uh, 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 those municipalities have some democratic processes, legal, political, ethical, and other commitments, and they're subject to procurement law. And this was the great thing that the BDS movement latched onto, because it said, aha, we can get those progressive and other councillors in these cities like Stockholm or Bordeaux or Dublin or, or, or up and down uh, the UK to listen to our arguments about how Veolia is violating international law. And of course they do coalition politics with people who care about the environment, people who aren't that excited that municipalities are selling off 
uh, uh, water services and privatizing them and so on. And it's a particular uh, article in procurement law that the BDS campaign hammers on, which is that, it, that companies are in uh, a violation of uh, grave professional misconduct if they're engaged in this. So you have these tremendous losses, and, and there's really such a long string of them. But the first key one, just to skip back to the timeline, it really is January 2009 with the Stockholm contracts, a very big contract, matters enormously to Veolia. And they lose it in the context of quite a, an effective campaign. Remember the official reasons? The, the Stockholm officially doesn't, call, as an entity, say they, 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 they didn't, they rejected the Veolia bid because of uh, political pressure. No, they don't say that. But still, this is where the, 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 the key uh, 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 op uh, opportunity that the BDS movement was able to make use of in the business structure of, of Veolia itself. And this campaign was underway you know, very explicitly in the UK in the Palestine Solidarity campaign from 2008. But if you search the business press, you see that you know, in their SWOT analysis, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, they clearly say this is the biggest threat to Veolia. They say when they say the government contracts of Veolia are subject to several intricate government procurement laws and regulations, which may lead to administrative, civil, and other sorts of penalties. So this is the business press saying, uh, sure, you've got to worry about when those municipal contracts are, uh, uh, are lost, and you have to uh, realize that it's a threat to be earlier. So it seems that, and, and you know, actually, different governments issued explicit procurement notices saying this applies to Veolia. I mean, here's the Scottish government saying it's, it definitely constitutes grave professional misconduct that they have exploited assets in illegal settlements and so on and so forth. So uh, now the, the withdrawal of Veolia, it meant that the investment wasn't wholly replaced by international capital. It required domestic capital. So it was a net blow to foreign investment. I guess this is still for me research in progress, but there are a series of French companies that have become cautious about investing in Israel since this whole uh, uh, issue came out. And I think it's, we can say that companies now know that complicity with major Israeli rights violations is a hazard, and that can weigh in finely balanced commercial decisions. And it also sends a signal to other key actors. On the other hand, this hasn't specifically led to short or you know, very little short-term improvement in Palestinian rights on the ground, although arguably the infrastructure of occupation and settlement is more fragile than it was. In a way, that's, that's a key point, I think, and perhaps I want to emphasise this point here. It's, point, it's bullet point four in the conclusion, which is that you know, if you're looking at a non-violent strategy of resistance, and you're confronted with soldiers and settlements and occupation and checkpoints, and you're, you exclude the possibility of violent confrontation. What is it that's open to you? Because, you know, remember, in the decolonizing world of the whole of the you know, from great portion of the 20th century, the, 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 you know, the great sort of tactic that was available to national liberation movements was guerrilla warfare. But if that's excluded, then how do you do it? Well, you have to somehow acquire leverage against those who are complicit with the soldiers and the settlements. So this is the indirect non-violent strategy that the Palestinian BDS movement has uh, you know, adopted. That has real potential, remember, because the infrastructures of contemporary globalized uh, capitalism are very interconnected across the world, and they require huge amounts of technical expertise. I mean, there's all this work that's being done now in the academy on the, the grammar and infrastructure of, <laughs> uh, of contemporary capital. And, and so to uh, insert oneself into that uh, kind of situation, that infrastructure and make it more fragile is a real and meaningful contemporary strategy of resistance. It also means to me that we shouldn't slight rights-based activism because the BDS movement is about fundamental human rights. You know, that's why I say to people here who want to become enormously worked up about it, uh, why? Because we're talking about fundamental human rights, not to live under occupation, not to live in, uh, against discrimination on the basis of ethnicity, and to have the right to return after the dispossession of 1948-9. Uh, but it's, not, it's partly the market and business structure of Veolia, but it's also the coalition politics that's very important to this kind of form of transnational solidarity. So just to close, 
I would say the stakes are very high here. This isn't just, a, uh, fortunately, just a, a question of tossing around academic ideas, because these, these movements play a fundamental role in constituting the world we live in. And on the one side, you have what I would see as a pessimistic and violent sectarianism, forms of ethno-nationalism and religious populism, which mark out a kind of a confrontation, if you will, or rather crudely described here between, you know, say, Zionism versus Islamic State, in that, against that binary, the BDS movement, and this is partly, you know, why I'm engaged with it as a citizen, as someone who, who is interested in, in the world and the significance of academic research, BDS seems to me to offer a hopeful, non-violent, cosmopolitan, anti-racist, decentralized, and radically democratic alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe we go next to you, Nicola. Yes. Nicola Pratt, she is a reader in international politics of the Middle East at the University of Warwick. Okay. Nicola, please. Ten minutes. Thank you. Is this working? Can you hear me yes. okay? Yes. Yeah. All right. So I want to thank John for organizing this event and to have uh, invited me. I feel really honored to share a platform with these very distinguished um, colleagues this evening. Um, I've been asked to talk about the academic boycott, what, what's, you know, uh, sort of um, informally called the academic boycott, i.e. the boycott of uh, Israeli academic institutions, and also a little about um, transnational feminism in relation to um, the BDS movement. So, uh, first of all... Um, the issue of the academic boycott. So several people in the audience here I recognise are probably even bigger experts than me on this topic and have been there from the start. Um, in 2004, Palestinian academics and intellectuals launched the Palestine, Palestinian Campaign for the Cultural and Academic Boycott. Um, there had, previous to this, been some discussion of academic um, boycotts um, but this is the, the official uh, launch. And um, this campaign was endorsed by Palestinian academics, um, cultural and other organisations, including the Federation of Unions of Palestinian Universities, Professors and Employees, which is the official uh, organisation for higher education staff in the occupied Palestinian territory. And since then, the academic boycott has become a global movement. Um, in the UK, and the UK is um, considered to be an important uh, centre of the um, academic boycott movement. Um, it's actually just over 10 years since UCU, um, UCU Congress, I should say, so UCU, the Union um, for University Lecturers in the UK. Um, the Congress voted to support the academic boycott uh, of Israel. Um, unfortunately, the Union executive then caved into pressures and threats um, and the executive overturned um, Congress's vote. Um, they, they received legal advice that, um, that the boycott would be, would be somehow discriminatory and therefore could not be implemented, which in a minute I will um, uh, argue against. Um, in 2015, um, BRICUP, which is the British um, Committee for Universities in Palestine, um, launched an open letter in support of Palestinian human rights, the centrepiece of which was commitment to um, the principles of academic boycott, which has been signed uh, until now by more than 700 UK-based academics. And if you haven't seen that letter, I would encourage you to look for it online, and if you're a UK-based academic, to, to sign if you haven't done so or already. So unsurprisingly, supporters of Israel have been very vocal in condemning the academic boycott, often resource, by resorting to its mischaracterization. <coughs> Foremost, they've claimed that the boycott is discriminatory, um, which um, is, at, at, is false, because actually the academic boycott does not target individuals because of their nationality. The uh, target of the boycott is Israeli academic institutions and their official representatives. So you could be of any nationality working in an Israeli institution. It's not about you being an Israeli. Um, the other issue is that it's not an indefinite call to boycott Israel. 
again, it's not an indefinite call to boycott Israel because it's Israel, but rather it's a call to boycott Israel until it ends its systematic violations of international law. And as Omar has already laid out, those have very, those are already um, been uh, you know, set out in the BDS call. Another, a number of other arguments have been put forward to delegitimize BDS, um, often by people who claim to be supporting Palestinian rights or peace in Israel-Palestine. Um, so I'm going to address probably the most commonly heard criticism put forward against the academic boycott, which is that it's a violation of academic freedom. And um, you know, universities, UK, for example, which is the body of um, un the body sort of representing the collective of universities in the UK, they've regularly um, condemned uh, any expression of support for academic boycott on the basis that it's against uh, academic freedom. But I'm now going to say why it's not. Um, okay, so according to UNESCO, um, which I think is a very um, well-established definition of academic freedom from which to work, academic freedom is the right to freedom of teaching and discussion, freedom in carrying out research and disseminating and publishing the results thereof, freedom to express freely their opinion about the institutional system in which they work, freedom from institutional censorship, and freedom to participate in professional or representative academic bodies. So according to that definition, BDS is not a violation of academic freedom. None of the um, core tenets of the, of the call for academic boycott would stop any, um, Israel, any academic in an Israeli university from teaching what they want, from expressing their opinions, from attending international conferences, from publishing their research, or meeting with colleagues from institutions in other parts of the world. The aim of the boycott is to disrupt business as usual for Israeli academic institutions. And this is because they are, they are and they continue to be complicit with the Israeli government's systematic violation of Palestinian rights. Um, so, whilst opponents of BDS are arguing that BDS undermines academic freedom, uh, it's actually the contrary that those who, that rather, it's those who are opposing BDS who are the ones who are undermining academic freedom, and any, and in particular, discussion uh, to prevent discussion of BDS and also any discussion of Israel that's deemed to be critical. So in the UK. Supporters of Israel have tried to shut down academic conferences that deal with Israel in a critical manner, which they successfully achieved at Southampton University in 2015. Um, that conference was reorganised and held in, in, in Ireland um, la, earlier this year. Um, an organisation that calls itself UK Lawyers for Israel, for example, provides online um, advice to students on how to use the prevent duty to stop talks on campus which are deemed anti-Israeli. The efforts of Israel's supporters to stifle criticism of Israel is having an insidious effect on academic freedom in our universities. I mean, I have um, somebody who, uh, a colleague who, who does seminars for my module. My module is on Israel-Palestine. She is fearful of, of, of actually <laughs> Um, you know, convening the, those seminars because she's afraid of, especially as somebody who's on a temporary contract, you know, a, um, a fixed term contract, precarious employment, um, she's fearful of being labelled somehow anti-Semitic for something she might say in that seminar class. And, um, and this, is, this is also often how um, op uh, opponents of BDS intimidate, in particular, uh, they target actually um, early career academics who who are on um, fixed term contracts for this reason of in, you know uh, of creating fear. It's also really important to um, emphasise that actually it's Israel's colonial policies that are a significant obstacle to Palestinian academic freedoms and rights to education. So the Israeli occupation actively and relentlessly isolates Palestinian, organization, Palestinian educational organizations from global networks. It's very difficult for Palestinian students, teachers, and academics to leave the country to study or to attend conferences. 
Under Israel's 10-year um, blockade of the Gaza Strip, Palestinian students are prevented from traveling to, the West Bank, to West Bank universities and vice versa. They face difficulties obtaining visas for international travel and often cannot even exit through the Rafa crossing due to frequent closures. Meanwhile, Palestinians in the West Bank are obliged to travel overland through Jordan in order to catch an international flight, which adds a whole extra day to your travel. Um, while uh, 48 uh, Palestinian and Jerusalem, Jerusalemite, Jerusalemite Palestinians, <laughs> Palestinians in Jerusalem, I should say, sorry, um, who are able to travel through Ben Gurion Airport but face humiliating security procedures. Unsurprisingly, it's very unusual to meet Palestinian academics at international conferences. Since 1967, in addition, Israel has periodically shut down and militarily, militarily targeted Palestinian universities. During uh, Israel's 2014 war on Gaza, educational facilities in the Gaza Strip were bombed and several West Bank universities were raided by the Israeli authorities. Um, there are so many stories. Um, many, many students... Many students and academics of Palestinian universities are arrested and detained each year by the occupation forces. Again, several examples um, of that. Israel also targets foreign academics who try to travel to Palestine to give lectures. Um, at least 115 British citizens were denied entry during 2016 due to their suspected support for Palestinian human rights. Uh, last year, a senior lecturer from SOAS, Dr. Adam Hania, was refused entry to the Palestinian territory and questioned for 10 hours at Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv and held overnight in a detention centre and deported and has been banned from entering Israel for 10 years. So who is the one that's violating academic freedom? Um, I think I have a minute just to say yes. something very brief. <laughs> okay, so uh, unfortunately, okay. So the question of boycott and feminist solidarity. So um, I should say my support for BDS does come from my commitment to transnational feminism. Um, and transnational feminism recognises the ways in which intersecting and mutually con constituting structures of gender, race, class and other significant social structures shape women's and men's lives. So for me, the BDS movement is actually um, a, a very powerful form of feminist, uh, transnational feminist praxis of solidarity with um, not just Palestinian women, but also uh, Palestinians in general, um, not only in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, but um, the Palestinian people in entirety. So I'll stop there. Mm. And you, you will speak at the, yeah. yeah. And finally, we have Rafif Siada, who's a lecturer in comparative politics of the Middle East at SOAS. Please, um, 10 minutes. Thank you very much to the organizers like John. I am extremely excited at this space to be able to have discussions between activists and academics. Uh, I think oftentimes, and academics won't be very happy with me for saying this, uh, we tend to tail end activist movements and theorize after the action has already taken place. So this is a beautiful space that we have opened up here for this conversation. And thank you, John, for all of the organizing you did. Um, I also wanted to recognize and thank Emma for all of the incredible work she has done in putting this event together. I think one great thing about activist spaces is the recognition of the work that goes on behind the scenes as well as in front of the scenes. And thanks to all of you. Um, I know there's a bit of tension in the air, so everybody take a deep breath. It's okay. We're going to have a great conversation. Um, I made a very big mistake when I was in high school and joined the basketball team. Um, clearly, looking at me, basketball should not have been one of the things that I should have ever entered. Um, it was a huge mistake. Every time I played, there was a big woman from the rival team called Sandra. I still remember her name. And every time she would come towards me, I would literally fly across the entire court to the other end. And the coach kept telling me to plant my feet. And one day, in slow motion, Sandra was coming towards me. I was getting ready to be trampled by her. And I heard him in slow motion say, plant your feet. So I was like, this is my stand. I don't care what's going to happen. And I planted my feet. And Sandra actually went back half a step. Uh, and for me, this was a huge victory. Um, 
and it taught me a lot about planting your feet. Because I think as Palestinians in exile, it's very difficult for us to be where we are while we're always longing to go back to our homes and lands. It's very difficult when you're a third or a fourth generation refugee to constantly be longing for a place sometimes that you don't know and you've never seen, and at the same time be planted where you are and be in solidarity with the struggles where you are. So my take on solidarity is a little bit different as a person in exile. On June 14th, many of us in this room watched as 24-story Grenfell Tower went up in flames. The numbers of deaths are still yet to be determined, and justice is hanging still on inquiries, and we don't know when these inquiries will come to an end. The fire exposed what many of the residents had been complaining about for quite some time, a structural, chronic neglect with the intent of social cleansing right here in London. I start here because the logic and the structures that allow for Grenfell to happen are the same structures that allow for Theresa May to be celebrating the Belfort Declaration and ignoring its colonial legacy. From Grenfell to Palestine, from the prison industrial complex, the military industrial complex, the marketization of education, the chronic underfunding of the National Health Service, Europe's extremely racist migration policies, there is a market logic that's consistently telling us that some people are dispensable, that some people don't need dignity, don't need freedom, and can be excluded, less deserving of an equal living. I start here because I think transnational solidarity, in my view, means a sincere belief that liberation for Palestinians is intrinsically intertwined with liberation for others as well. Not as a slogan, but as actually a real commitment that our freedom will not be achieved without freedom for others. In that sense, my inspiration has been and will always be Hamdallah, Najil Ali's little boy who had his back turned to the world waiting for his right to return home. Because Hamdallah did not just represent the Palestinian refugee, he represented everyone considered indispensable, everyone fighting for freedom. And that is what the BDS movement is all about. One of the questions that was posed and I found very interesting about the conversation we're having today is what sort of transnational solidarity does the BDS campaign propose? I just want to talk about three aspects in 10 minutes, there's very little you can do, so I'll just gesture towards a few things and we can speak about them in discussion. I think it proposes a solidarity that is based on Palestinian rights and cementing the Palestinian narrative within that. It proposes a solidarity that is rooted in people's power and it proposes a campaign that is solidly built not just on receiving solidarity but also extending solidarity. So let me start on the emphasis on the Palestinian narrative. For me, it's simply impossible to speak about Palestine or any solutions without beginning from the understanding that the Palestinian Nakba, the catastrophe, is an ongoing process, not a singular point in time. That the legacy of the Belfort Declaration is something that we are still living to this day. Now, the Oslo process, as Samia so eloquently explained earlier, essentially changed Palestine into a conflict resolution question, into building a statehood project where we can negotiate over smaller slivers of Palestine that is ruled over by the Palestinian Authority. The power of the 2005 BDS call lay in its explicit linkage of all sectors of Palestinian society, not in just talking about the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, in recognizing four first and foremost, the right of return for Palestinian refugees, which continue to be the majority of the Palestinian people. I'm often perplexed that people speak about Palestine without speaking about refugees and without speaking about the right of return. We are the majority of Palestinians. People speaking of Gaza need to recognize the majority of Gaza are refugees from other parts of Palestine. So I think this is one of the strengths and for me, this is especially important in conceptions of transnational solidarity because it places Palestinians not as victims, but as active agents in our own liberation. We're not just there watching. Uh, we are actually putting forward demands that are about the entirety of the Palestinian people. For me, the flip side of ignoring the Palestinian narrative, of centering Palestinian rights, 
is the obsession with some extremely, of some extremely well-meaning individuals to have the perpetual victimization of Palestinians front and center. To some organizations, the Palestinian voice is there to recount suffering. You would not believe the amount of uh, invitations I get that say, you speak about what happened to you and your life story, and someone else will be there to talk about theory and other things that are political. <laughs> we are more than just the massacres we have had to endure. We are a people fighting for liberation. Second, uh, the emphasis on building a people's movement. It's very important to remember that BDS emerged in the context of the crisis of the Oslo process, but it also emerged after the ICJ, International Criminal Court of Justice, a decision on the illegality of the apartheid wall. And before that decision, Palestinians were so excited. We were going to get another ruling that was on our side. The wall was illegal, it, the entire infrastructure around it was illegal, and we had to do something about it. And the, the court date did come, and we got the result, and everyone was happy. We celebrated for about a day, and quickly realized the international community, or the so-called international community, was not going to take any action. So the BDS appeal was an appeal to people power was an appeal similar to the calls that went out from apartheid South Africa or the civil rights movement or the Gandhi boycott for people power, for looking at how each one of us and our institutions are complicit and the governments that we belong to and supposedly elect are complicit in the ongoing settler colonialism and occupation of Palestine. This was a huge <coughs> shift and transformation in the logic. Rather than having things decided by power brokers and in secret negotiating tables, it was taking the power back and giving it to people like you, giving it to people of conscience around the world. In that, it also gave an explicit direction of travel and answered the question of action. Because I remember at the beginning of the Intifada, we would have endless events about the ongoing massacres. We talked about Jenin, we talked about the repression, we talked about political prisoners, and there was always the question, okay, now I know, it's horrible, the situation is really bad, but what can I do? And BDS helped to answer that question of what can people actually do to make a difference, to impact change. And finally, I wanted to speak about the emphasis on sol solidarity as reciprocal. Now, this doesn't mean that our situation is identical to every other situation in the world. It doesn't mean that when black protesters from Black Lives Matter are on the streets of Chicago or other cities, that they face exactly what we face. But that there is a commonality between all our struggles. And that solidarity is praxis. It's not just theoretical. It is also, from what I have been involved in, requires massive patience, but also humility. Humility to understand what other struggles are about. Humility to understand what someone in front of you would have gone through. Um, this was especially evident to me doing uh, indigenous solidarity in a place like Canada. Suddenly finding myself as a Palestinian also being in a settler in a new place and speaking with indigenous activists about what that means and seeing them welcome our support and our solidarity as Palestinians. It really opened up that discussion and it puts front and center the question of who our allies are. And I think this is something that often gets forgotten. Um, who you're, so people often use the term standing shoulder to shoulder. Well, it's important every now and then to actually look around your shoulder and check who you're standing next to. And I think BDS allows us to do that in building the movement. Um, I will wrap up by just saying, <coughs> I think there are challenges that remain and we face them uh, every day. Um, I really like the formulation that Alan Sears has used of building an infrastructure of dissent. I think this is really important because uh, the state of Israel has targeted Palestinian national fabric and the fabric of the resistance. It has targeted Palestinian society in every way. The infrastructure of dissent that was able to really fortify the first Intifada, for example, was wrecked during the Oslo peace process. And we can discuss how it was wrecked and why it was wrecked. But th the fact is, we really need to be building an infrastructure of dissent within Palestine and internationally. And I think uh, Alan defines the infrastructure of dissent as a means through which activists develop political communities capable of learning, 
communication and mobilizing together. So yes, there are the campaigns that we do, and that's really important. But there is also how do we build the infrastructure to sustain our movement in the long term. This means looking at every individual in the movement as someone who can contribute. It means doing collective training and sharing information so everyone can actually step into the role that they would like to do. Um, again, some academics would be upset at me for saying this, but it also means stepping away from the division between the intellectual and the academic and the activist, blurring these lines a little bit and realizing there's much we need to learn from each other. Now, we're not socialized to break these boundaries, uh, particularly the division between mental and manual labor. So you will have people like giving speeches and other people out postering until two in the morning. Uh, in a place like Canada, when it gets to minus 40, <laughs> that's quite something. So breaking that division between those two types of labor. I say this because these kinds of divisions often tend to be reinforced, particularly when it comes to a gender division of labor, between some men being the public uh, figures and faces of movements. Um, a good friend of mine recently uh, taught me the term manal, which is a panel of all men. Uh, again, you would be surprised at the number of times I get invitations that say, we're really sorry, we forgot to invite a Palestinian, we forgot to invite a woman, so we're inviting you, and it's tomorrow at 2 o'clock. I think these are things worth thinking about as we build our infrastructure of dissent, that uh, we don't want to be reinforcing these kinds of divisions. And finally, the, the politics geek within me really needs to say this. Uh, we really need to think of Palestine in the regional context. Most of you have seen what's happening in Saudi Arabia. Uh, there is massive trends towards normalization between Gulf countries in the Arabian Peninsula and the state of Israel. This is something we really need to be aware of. Uh, Palestine is not isolated from the rest of the region. And uh, Abu Mazen uh, was sent off to Mahmoud Abbas, was sent off to Saudi Arabia. We still don't know what's happening out of that. But I think it's really <coughs> important to keep our eye out on these regional politics and the context. Not to mention some of the British ministers who are promising um, aid to the Israeli army and calling it humanitarian aid, as the news broke today. So these are just political things to think through um, as we have our discussion. Thank you all very much. <laughs>Thank you very much for all speakers and for sticking, roughly speaking, to time. Uh, we now have plenty of opportunity for asking question and answer session. Sir, I will allow you first to go. I believe you had two questions. Maybe you can pick one of them. Did you write them down? I, not really. And if you could please wait for the microphone, please. And if you could say to whom your question is addressed. Give it somebody else first, because I, I need to remember. Okay, that. okay, that's fine. We're gonna go. We're gonna we're gonna uh, sort of uh, collect maybe two or three questions. We're gonna start with the lady in the yellow first. Okay. Uh, let me let me first of all choose first you, then the gentleman over there, and then maybe you. Okay. Um, thank you. I mean, I would like to add congratulations to LSE for hosting this event and to the organisers for putting it on. Um, I, think, I think it's extremely important what's happening here. And I know that Omar is going to be speaking in Cambridge, uh, which is where I'm based at university tomorrow, and I hope he will have a similarly large audience and a good reception there. I'm sure he will because people have been very excited about him coming. My question is actually picking up from where Rafif left off, which is, and really I'd, since Rafif addressed it a little bit, I'll direct it to Omar and perhaps to Samia, is whether you could reflect on the relationship between the BDS as a movement and the wider questions, if you like, of um, what role Palestine plays in movements against the Arab regimes, which form the backline and the support for the occupation of, of Palestine, that is without, you know, without Egypt's um, contribution to the occupation, um, I don't think that it would, have, it would have continued, and likewise, we already mentioned Saudi Arabia and so on, so that would be Thank something to you. talk about. Thank you. Uh, if you. If you can give the microphone to the gentleman here, please. 
Yeah, I want to uh, echo my thanks. Um, I have just two very brief questions uh, to Omar. Um, I mean, a lot of us know about the decentralization model and how that led to a lot of the successes of BDS. Um, could you just tell us a bit about how the decentralization works in practice? Who gets to set up BDS chapters? Um, and the role of uh, BDS in the Arab Gulf specifically, uh, in, in light of what was mentioned by Rafif in the end. My second question is with regards to uh, how BDS kind of positions itself with international human rights organizations, um, particularly Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, who do not take a position on BDS and cannot because of their mandate. However, uh, they've been um, more progressive, I should say, recently, specifically Human Rights Watch's recent report. I know you weren't a fan of it, uh, but to what extent do you think that uh, uh, those alliances could be leveraged and, and built upon? Thank you. Okay. And then the lady here, if we can bring the mic here. Do you mind passing it along, please? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody on the panel. It was a really great discussion. Um, my question actually is for everybody on the panel. I just was um, hoping that as, um, as people studying solidarity, but also as people who have been sort of active in it, if you could reflect on how, um, how BDS has uh, sort of shaped international solidarity with Palestine. I'm assuming that you've looked at um, solidarity before the BDS movement also, and I'm just curious, I mean, you touched on it a bit, uh, Rafif, but curious about some of the things that have have drawn from uh, from sort of historical solidarity and maybe some of the newer things. Okay. Who, who wishes to start? Shall we... Shall we Samia? Pick it up. Yeah. Okay. Try and please keep it brief. We're five panelists <laughs> and some question addressed to all of them. Uh, I would like to get more questions in, so keep it as brief, please, as you can. Okay. Thank you. Uh, on the uh, briefly on the question of uh, role of Palestine in uh, movements against the Arab regime uh, regimes, um, I think there has been, in a way, um, a lot of inspiration coming from uh, the Palestinians um, in terms of um, you know how we articulate our resistance in the first Intifada, in the second Intifada. Uh, how every level of life actually tries to challenge colonial colo colonization and oppression, despite the fact that we are living it, you know, day in, day out, and despite the fact that Israel has been, in a way, designing and devising uh, mechanisms of oppression uh, at, you know, at every point and uh, every level. So I think there has been an inspiration of us not accepting oppression, uh, us not uh, uh, just surviving this oppression, but challenging it. Um, how BDS uh, shaped solidarity with uh, Palestine, um, I think uh, the point that Rafif mentioned is, um, I mean, before BDS, everyone used to feel uh, pity for us, you know, the poor Palestinians getting shot at, uh, murdered, uh, bandestinized, uh, uh, hostage, imprisoned. You know, we really feel sorry for the Palestinians. And uh, most of this uh, sense of pity used to be translated into charity support. So the, those who really felt strongly about our case ended up either you know, giving out donations or money or organizing something charitable. Now, um, I mean, in our case, it's not charity what we are after. I mean, we're, you know, we're a people with a political cause. Our issue is political. We are a people of dignity. And hence, what we require and required and still require is political solidarity. And how we define it as Palestinians is basically um, political pressure on Israel in the form of economic, uh, academic, cultural, and sports uh, boycott. Hence, respecting. Uh, uh, this demand and acting upon it is actually the role that BDS has played in reshaping solidarity uh, with the Palestinians. Now, Israel has been informing us that us in Palestine and you uh, in the rest of the world have been very effective. So BDS has been very effective. So for us is a way 
in a way, it's, it's, it's the way forward uh, to uh, heighten and increase uh, this pressure in every sort and uh, domain. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, sure. Relationships between BDS and uh, various uh, movements in, in, um, against Arab uh, regimes. The global BDS movement is led by the Palestinian BDS National Committee, which is the largest coalition in Palestinian society. I mean, it includes every main entity, political, social, um, unions, uh, women, every main group is part of the BNC. And therefore, we move very slowly, and we do not move beyond our mandate. In other words, we adopt the platform ending occupation, ending apartheid, and the right of return. We don't take any position beyond that because it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to get this massive coalition to agree on anything. One state versus two states, that, uh, what kind of uh, social democracy, that, nothing we can agree on. <laughs> Palestinians disagree on a lot of things. Uh, so to, to maintain this unity for 12 years took a lot of work and uh, very strict uh, adherence to the three points of uh, unity. Uh, but in general, it is a progressive coalition as far as various social issues are, are concerned. So our natural allies in the Arab world would be the social movements uh, that, that fight against uh, uh, authoritarian regimes, obviously. We often attack those authoritarian regimes as they violate uh, BDS guidelines, as Rafif mentioned, with normalization and so on, and we support opposition uh, to them. We're, we've become much more open about that while maintaining this consensus in the coalition, which is re really difficult. Uh, on the decentralization, how it works, it is it is a leadership, not in the pyramidic sense, sense, but in setting the guidelines. So let's say a group of women in Leicester want to establish a BDS chapter that connects it with feminism, let's say. Uh, uh, as long as they agree with the basic tenets of the BDS call, they decide their own campaigns. We defer to their judgment. Uh, so long as they do not uh, conflict with any of the main principles. Let's say they adopt some position that is uh, racist. Uh, anti-Semitic, uh, Islamophobic, we would intervene and we would tell them this violates our main principles. You cannot be part of the BDS movement. You cannot carry the name BDS if you are adopting a racist position or discourse. So we would intervene only in cases where our principles are being uh, um, infringed uh, upon. Human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty, we very much appreciate where they're moving. They're moving in the right direction for sure. And we differentiate uh, strategically between partners in the BDS movement and allies and, and uh, organizations that we can have uh, some common denominator with, like Human Rights Watch on the FIFA campaign, trying to uh, 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 um, freeze Israel out of uh, FIFA because of its violations, settlement teams, and so on. Human Rights Watch is on that campaign. They wouldn't go as far as um, defending the right of return for refugees, possibly, but they would agree with certain aspects. They wouldn't call for a boycott, but they would call, Amnesty has called for a ban on settlement goods. So uh, it's a flexible uh, movement, so long as there's no infringement on our uh, basic rights. The very last thing I want to say is that maybe some, s some solidarity groups have been doing political work, not just charitable uh, work, including here in the UK. Many, many people in the UK have done amazing solidarity work pre-BDS, but not very effective. Political, but not very effective. What I called getting addicted to marginalization, I meant it. Um, very briefly, as somebody who was involved in the not so effective political <laughs> solidarity pre-BDS. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, no, no, no. But I, I do, I, I guess I just want to echo what Rafif said. So as, as somebody who was involved in Palestine solidarity activity before BDS, um, then uh, there were, I remember during the second intifada and getting an email from somebody I know who was at that time under siege in Ramallah and, and him describing what was happening and feeling so helpless. I mean, like, what, what, can, what can we do? I mean, this is, like, unbelievable what's happening. So, um, you know, I, I mean, previous to BDS, it was, there were demonstrations, there were letters, but I think BDS really does give such um, a, an important, tangible focus and, and, and effective it is effective, and and as an ac and it's something that we can also do as individuals. We don't have to always uh, wait until somebody organises 
a demonstration or, you know, for those of us who don't want to lead, for those of us who just like to follow, then, um, you know, I, I think it is really um, it's a game changer. It was a game changer. Thank you. Our feet. Yes, I, I will be really brief, I promise. Um, Thank you. Part of what I was saying about infrastructure of descent, I think, is also about being very strategic. Because once you build this infrastructure where there's, there's more people that are able to come into the movement, you're also outward looking. Um, it's not just, you know, quite often the, a lot of groups are a, a few people, they all agree with each other, they've gotten used to the dynamics of how they do work together. But if we try to build an infrastructure of dissent that's outward looking, we're actually thinking of how to engage more people, how to reach, uh, how to reach more people in strategic campaigns. And I can discuss what strategic campaigns means endlessly, but I do think there are groups uh, in England that have done it and are doing exceptionally amazing work. And if anyone here is now very interested and convinced in BDS, uh, I would highly recommend looking at the website of War on Want because they have campaigns like the Stop Israel, uh, Stop Arming Israel campaign, the Stop G4S campaign was also highly successful here. Uh, looking at th those two campaigns is really useful. Uh, we have a lot of people from BrickUp here as well. Uh, Please have conversations with them and, and members of BrickUp on the panel. Um, have conversations with them about how do we continue to build the BDS movement within campuses. Uh, we, we do need to do this together. And the reason I really like this space is we can have these conversations. Uh, John has kindly agreed that maybe he doesn't need I'll to. I'll just come in maybe once before <laughs> the end. But yes, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course, <laughs> but maybe not in this uh, sort of question round. So first of all, are, are you ready to ask yeah. your question? Um, so first of all, we get, uh, and if I could say uh, for the, um, wait, wait a second, because I'm going to pick number two and three as well. <laughs> if you could ideally address your question to one panel member rather than saying, <laughs> Know, to all panel members, because that means a few questions. We'll have you first, just a second. Uh, we'll have you second, and we'll have you, uh, gentlemen, Mike, maybe later on, uh, as third. So, uh, yes, please. Thank you. Um, is that on? Yeah. Um, sorry about my outburst earlier. Um, I apologize for that. But on the whole, it's been a very good evening. And thank you for, on the whole, being not anti Semitic. Okay. On the whole? Uh, there was one well, thing which I pointed well, out, and, and we'll leave that. Are okay. I'm apologising. Okay. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. So, um, on the BDS movement, where do you see the the right of return leading to a one-state solution, obviously? And what is your outcome goal of that one-state solution? Is it that it is a Palestinian state, or that it's still the state of Israel? Uh, on a second point, sorry, because it ties in, if you go back through the history of Israel, back to maybe, or Palestine, back to the 1880s, and you look at the demographics of people that lived in the region, which has been quite extensively uh, noted down by travellers to the area, British and French, um, you'll see that the population actually of Arabs in the, Pal in the land of Palestine was only about 400,000 at the time. And a lot of migration took place in the early 1900s because of settlements and kibbutzes that were bought quite legally off Arab sheikhs and Arab landowners. Mm. And people came in from the surrounding areas, such as Jordan, Syria, or what would have been Jordan in the time. And you look at the area of British Mandate Palestine as well, and the amount of land that Jordan took from the Palestinians and other nations took from the Palestinians. My question is, yeah. why is it all about Israel? And this is why for a lot of Israelis or Jewish people, it seems particularly nasty to isolate Israel as the only nation to be the problem in all of this. Thank you. Is your, is your question? Uh, it's just the general question. Thank you. Okay, but maybe we can see who... A few. <laughs> <laughs> it's that question. Shouting for Rafif. <laughs> you, you will answer that question. Okay. Yeah, thank you for an informative panel. Uh, my question to you, Rafif, you mentioned at the end about the uh, ongoing, just the beginning, perhaps, and I, I have my doubt that it is just the beginning of normalization with countries like Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. It's been going on for a long time. But do you, could you please um, 
elaborate on the um, uh, how, for example, uh, your um, movement can link or influence what goes on in a society that is deprived of civil society, that uh, the culture's uh, infrastructure of dissent is being dismantled. Uh, how do you operate in that context? How do you influence public opinion in a country like that? Okay. And then the gentleman here, if we can pass on the microphone, please. Yes, um, Nicola, forgive me. I, I'm going to address this to, to Omar, if I may. Um, One feminist? <laughs> <laughs> well, because it's some, an issue that, that Nicola raised, but, but uh, I have the chance to ask you. Um, BDS is not um, targeting, does not target individuals, it targets institutions. That's what we've heard. But I've frequently heard critics of BDS, academic BDS, um, uh, say that this is a distinction without a difference. That, uh, in fact, when you refuse cooperation with Israeli universities for, say, accreditation purposes or for examining or joint supervision uh, or supporting fund applications, you are, in fact, undermining the freedom of Israeli academics. So uh, this, I, I sh may say in parentheses, is, was the main t uh, means of attack of John Chalcroft the, the previous time when he tried to discuss BDS at the LSE. So I'd, I'd be very much interested to hear how you respond to that. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to start with you. There were three questions already. Uh, yes, there were three oh, questions already. Yes. Yes. Um, I'll start with the question on uh, GCC countries, Gulf Cooperation uh, Council countries. I 100% uh, agree with you. The normalization is not new whatsoever. It's just now uh, more apparent, more blatant. And with the way the direction of travel is heading, um, I think there's something cooking about a new regional order, essentially, where normalization with Israel uh, becomes part and parcel of, of, how of the structure of the region. And I think this is really a critical moment where we need to intervene. And, and actually, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions National Committee has been intervening and putting out press statements. Um, there is going to be a conference very soon in Kuwait. I don't remember the date, Omar. 17. Uh, but quite soon, uh, trying to specifically target this issue of normalization and the GCC. Of course, it's extremely difficult to intervene uh, under such circumstances. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, there's horrendous freedoms. Uh, people are afraid to speak publicly. People are afraid to criticize. Um, but I do think on the popular level, we shouldn't underestimate that this may be the direction of travel at the top levels and the, and the state, but not at the popular level. And I think what we need to do is sort of shake that popular level a little bit, and that's what we're trying to do in BDS. It, it's very difficult, but what can we do? We can just try. Um, I'll, I'll let others answer and then get back to the right of return question. Yes, there's a, I think there's a right of return question and also why is Israel targeted. Mm. If I understand you correctly, when other Arab nations are mistreating Palestinians... You that well, human rights in other nations. In mm. other nations. If you look at how uh, the Kurdi Kurdish people at the moment... Okay, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll get back to this. We'll uh, try the, the last question. Okay, um, if you could address the one state. To state issue? Okay. She will, um, yeah. So yours is okay, essentially, so you know, if you are targeting sure. Israeli institutions, are you not implicitly, yeah, indirectly sure. targeting? Before answering that, I just wanted to give an example on the Gulf, uh, a bright example, Kuwait. Mm -hmm. uh, Kuwait a pl uh, played a decisive role in the Veolia campaign. Mm -hmm. In fact, Veolia's loss after the Gaza massacre in 2014 of two contracts in Kuwait, 1.5 billion and 750 million, was the final straw that really broke Veolia's back. After that, stockholders in Veolia started shouting, let's move out of the Israel contracts that violate human rights. We're losing too many contracts to worry about uh, the Israeli business. So they moved out in, in 2015. The head of the Kuwaiti parliament recently. Yes, yes. So we have some really bright examples of uh, leverage in, in the Gulf states. Regarding the academic boycott, uh, 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 Robert, you said it undermines freedoms of Israeli uh, uh, academics, the argument is made, uh, when you target universities. What's the distinction? Is it, uh, are we splitting hairs here? Usually, this argument comes from people who had no problem supporting the academic boycott of apartheid South Africa, which I was part of when I went to school in New York, 
it, then we targeted every single individual academic as well as every single institution in South Africa. So I can't imagine why would anyone support a blanket boycott, including of individuals in South Africa, and now shout about an institutional boycott that it doesn't make a distinction between institutions and individuals. Hypocrisy is taken to the level of art. Uh, um, now, but on its merits, regardless of the hypocrisy, on its merits, uh, is there any infringement? We've heard the UNESCO definition. There are other UN definitions of academic freedom. In all of them, there is nothing about uh, infringing on academic privileges being an infringement on academic freedom. If an Israeli university that's complicit in building the wall, settlements, war crimes in Gaza, and so on, like Tel Aviv University, is targeted and loses a lot of revenue and cannot give its academics the perks and privileges that they currently take for granted, so be it. They've got to end the complicity of their institution in violations of our human rights in order to be normal and accepted as a normal university in the world. If they cannot do that, well, tough. Those are privileges. Those are not academic freedoms. And there's a ma major difference there. Gatti, the two questions from the gentleman in the back. Please. Sure. O on the question of the right of return, um, as John said a few times, uh, boycotts, divestment, sanctions is a rights-based movement. The right of return is a UN stipulated right. Um, aside from being UN stipulated in Resolution 194, um, I think it's a basic human right if people were kicked out of their homes to be able to return. I don't really see what the big problem is with people like myself or my family being able to go home. If somebody kicked you out of your home tomorrow morning, I would fight for your right to return to that home. Um, and I think it's just that kind of basic human decency that uh, uh, people that have been living in refugee camps and scattered around the world deserve to go back to their homes is, is sort of a basic human decency point for me. I think there's a very um, nice line that I learned from no one is illegal activist that says, um, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. I didn't pick on Israel, Israel picked on me. And usually this question is always asked, why Israel, why Israel? Um, it's because it's a state that's treated as one above the law. Uh, there's laws that do not seem to apply to Israel but seem to apply other states. We, we're simply asking for this in whip of international law that's usually held up against other states to also be applied. Um, it's, it's the reverse that exists. It's this one state that is above the law. It doesn't get treated equally. Um, regardless, of human, regardless of human rights violations, regardless of how many reports come out by Amnesty and Human Rights Watch and a load of other organizations, um, nothing holds Israel to account. As a matter of fact, there's continued arms funding, diplomatic ties. So it's this relationship that's unfair that we're trying to address. In terms of one state, two state, as Omar mentioned earlier, um, the BDS movement in itself does not take a position on this because it is a rights-based movement. It's about basic rights enshrined in international law. Um, if people want to debate what kind of eventual state it will be. I think it's up to the people living in that region to decide how it should look. Thank you very much. Um, listen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is almost 8 o'clock. We only have the room until 8 o'clock, so I think I, I need to draw it to uh, a, a close here. Uh, I think it's been, on the whole, an orderly event. Uh, so if some of you want to stay behind and maybe ask questions, I don't think that is a problem. I know, Nicola, you have to leave and go back to uh, Warwick. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. And, uh, <laughs>